I'm reminded of Martin Luther when he challenged Erasmus and said, your thoughts of God are too human. And we're going to look now at the second of three omnis about God. We talked about his omniscience, which is that he knows everything, uh, everything we do, everything we say, everything we think. And now we're going to look at the omnipresence of God, and that's verses 7 through 12. So let's read it. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths or in Sheol, or you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me, your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the light will not be, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The light will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Okay, what do we mean by omnipresence? Uh, the first part, omni means all. Means all. And then the next part, present, means that God is present everywhere and on a personal level. God is present everywhere and on a personal level. Uh, actually, consciously present to every single person, always and equally present. So present everywhere on a personal level to every single person, always equally present at all times and including us. So what we're talking about is God is always present. And not only that, but all of God is always present everywhere. I want to tell you just a <clears throat> story about a couple of people. University biology professor... And this, I don't know why he was saying this, because it wasn't a class in religion or philosophy, but he begins talking about evolution, and he writes with large letters on a, black, on a whiteboard, God is nowhere. In other words, God's not close, he's not distant, he's nowhere. Uh, there's just no God. And then he says, end of discussion, okay? That's, that's one scene from a university classroom. Second person is different from the professor. It's a 10-year-old ten, ten boy. He's a believer. He's a Christian. Uh, he's a boy born and raised in our state. And his family is packed and moving tomorrow morning from Mississippi to Maine. So that night the boy gets down on his knees and he prays, Goodbye, God, we're moving to Maine. <clears throat> boy was sure he could not find God in the state of Maine. All right, you got <clears throat> an atheist professor and a believer a believer, both got it wrong on omnipresence because God is not nowhere. He's now here. And when he arrives in Maine, the little Mississippi boy, God will be just as totally there as he was <coughs> um, when he lived in Mississippi. So, you know, this idea of God being everywhere all the time and all of God being everywhere all the time it was controversial because in, um, <clears throat> in, in the days of the Old Testament, each country and culture had local deities. Just to use an example, in Mississippi was located in the ancient Middle East. If you got in your car and drove from Rankin County west to Hines County and then north to Madison County, every time you crossed the county line, you'd find yourself in the jurisdiction of a different local God. So in the book of 1 Kings, what, what happens is that there is a contest between the prophets of Baal and Elijah. They put a sacrifice on the altar. They put wood on the altar. Uh, then they douse everything with water. And the challenge is, you call upon your gods, call upon Baal, I'll call upon Yahweh, and the one that lights the sacrifice will show himself to be the true God. And what was interesting was as the prophets of Baal jumped around, they jump around and they said, Oh, Baal, answer us. Elijah starts taunting the prophets, and all they do is begin 
uh, shouting louder, slashing themselves with swords and spears. And let me just read to you from Isaiah, excuse me, from, from um, over there in 1 Kings 18, beginning with verse 27. At noon, Elijah began to taunt them. Shout louder, he said. Surely he's a god. Perhaps he's deep in thought or busy or traveling. Maybe he's sleeping and must be awakened. In other words, the problem with your false god is that he, he's local. He's localized. He can only be in one place at a time. The true God is always everywhere present. So let's look now just to hammer out this idea of omnipresence at three realities that cannot hide us from the greater reality of God's omnipresence. Notice in the first place, the first big point here in green is this. The reality of distance cannot hide me from the Lord God. Notice that, distance. And we're talking about two dimensions here. First, there's the vertical dimension. He says, uh, if I go into the heavens, if I make my, my bed in the depths, in other words, vertically, if I could travel all the way to the edge of the universe, if I were able to uh, go to the very depths of the earth, uh, literally in the Hebrew it says, if I go to the edge of the universe, if I go to the heights, thou. It's very emphatic. Um, reminds me of a story out of Moscow back in uh, 1961. After making the first manned flight outside the Earth's atmosphere, Russian cosmonaut Yuri uh, Gagarin, uh, Gagarin, excuse me, G-A-G-A-R-I-N, uh, Gagarin, was quoted as saying, "I flew into space, but I did not see God there." And then um, that next Sunday, uh, now preacher's now going to be with the Lord, W.A. Criswell, senior pastor of First Baptist Church for over 50 years stood before the congregation, and he read verse 8, and he said, If that cosmonaut had flown into space and stepped out of his space capsule and taken off his space suit, he would have seen God. In other words, no matter where you go, how far out in the universe you go, God's there. Turn 180 degrees, go, go down, way down, to the very center of the earth, God's there. Then in verse 9, the distance changes from vertical to horizontal. Uh, the horizontal dimension, there is, uh, in this horizontal dimension, there is a challenge and a comfort. Notice it says, if I take the wings of the dawn. Now, what are the wings of the dawn? Well, uh, long ago in a galaxy far, far away, I, I signed on mornings, weekends at a radio station in Hattiesburg, and I had to be there about an hour and a half before sunrise to turn on the trans transmitter. And as the sun rose and I was drinking my cup of coffee over the eastern horizon, you would l literally see rays of sun shoot across the sky. So what he'd be saying in our language is this, if I could hitchhike on a ray of light from the sun and travel at the speed of light, I could go pretty far pretty fast. I didn't realize this. Uh, the speed of light is 186,000 miles a second. Think about that, 186,000 miles a second. That's 25 times around the world at the equator. So if I could travel the speed of a sunbeam, it would take me one-seventh of a second to go anywhere on the face of this earth if I could go anywhere you're there no matter where I land God is there so I mention this to you tonight in light of the fact that God is everywhere there is no such thing as a God forsaken place God is fully present everywhere on this earth everywhere in the universe wherever I go God is there so the challenge is this, when you go anywhere you go, God is there to witness everything you do. God is an eyewitness to everything you do, no matter where you are. 
One of my favorite books of all time is a book by a man named Jerry White entitled Honesty, Morality, and Conscience. And it talks about when White was on a tour of Southeastern Asia. He said that tantalizing opportunities for immoral behavior surrounded him, and many men in his troop thought, well, you know, I'm 10,000 miles away from my family. Well, White was part of an organization called the Navigators. How many of y'all have ever heard of the Navigators? And they memorized scripture, and before going over there, the navigator group that, that Jerry White was in memorized Psalm 139. And this is what he said. He said, after memorizing Psalm 139, it's easy to rationalize when you're 10,000 miles away from home, you're 10,000 miles from God. But these verses remind me, even when I'm separated from my wife and children, I'm not separated from my God or my wife's God, or my family's God. He said, that fact alone of knowing I was always in God's presence served as an effective means of preventing me from engaging in behaviors I should not be engaging in. On the presence of God, it's, it's a guardrail to keep us from running off the highway of holiness and wrecking our lives. But then the comfort to know is this, that in all the highs and lows of life, geographical, emotional, God is with you. He's walking with you, sometimes carrying you in his powerful arms. It says here, your right hand will hold me fast. The right hand is a symbol of power. So when you cannot carry on, God is carrying you. Hebrews 13, 5, I will never leave you or forsake you. So keep in mind that as you live and especially as you witness the words of Jesus Christ in Matthew 28, Surely I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So that moves us now from, from the first reality to the second reality. We've looked here and we see the reality of distance can't hide us from an omnipresent God. Secondly, notice the reality of darkness cannot hide me from the Lord God. That's verses 11 and 12. Surely darkness will hide me. Um, the problem is this. The problem is that we can't see in the dark, but darkness isn't a problem for God. There's no dark place we can go, whether it be emotional or physical, where we can hide from God. So, you know, again, the fact that God is with us in the darkness can be a challenge or a comfort, depending. Uh, I remember, some of you may remember, 19, July of 1977, Late afternoon, New York City's power supply broke down. That evening, it, when it turned dark, tens of thousands of people swarmed the streets to, root, to loot and burn the city. They pulled down steel shutters and grills from storefronts. They shattered plate glass windows, pulled, hauled away everything they could carry. Of course, the difference between 77 and 2022 is they do that in broad daylight now. But it seems like darkness provided an effective cover for the evil deeds. But the fact of the matter is this, there is no darkness for God. He sees everything you can't hide in the darkness. And the challenge is this, um, you know, we quote John 3, 16, but the context is this. Listen to verses 19 through 21 of John 3. This is the verdict, light is coming to the world, but people love darkness instead of light because their deeds are evil. Or, or, their deeds are evil. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light that it may be plainly seen for what they have done is clearly seen in the light of God. In other words, Everything we do, even if we're surrounded in darkness, as far as God is concerned, is done in bright light. Darkness cannot hide the darkest of our deeds. But I want you to be comforted by that, too, because however dark life may be for us, God is light. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, in our lives, darkness doesn't have the final say-so. God is with us even in the darkest places and the darkest of times. And God has even declared us to be children of light. So he brings the light of our presence into him. 
So omnipresence, distance cannot hide us from God. Darkness cannot hide us from God. And third, the reality of death cannot hide me from the Lord God. Look at verse 8. It says, if I make my bed in the depths, literally that is Sheol. And what Sheol is, is the grave. And, and now for us, death is the ultimate separation. Separation from body and soul. Separation from us and our loved ones. When death comes knocking, there's going to be separation, permanent separation, or so it seems. But even death cannot separate us from the presence of God. Now, I have a question here I've asked in the, in the lesson, and that's this. Is God present in hell? I used to say he wasn't present in hell, but let me read Revelation 14, 10, and 11. This is speaking of those who reject the Lamb of God. It says, and I quote, beginning with verse 10, actually 10, 10 and 11 in Revelation 14, They too will drink the wine of God's fury, which has been poured full strength into the cup of His wrath. They will be tormented with burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Hell is not the absence of God. What hell is, is, is God only displaying wrath to us eternally. God is, God is there, but He's not there to bless. He's only there to punish and to make sure that those who reject Jesus uh, feel the full fury of His wrath, undiluted, undiminished forever, no place to run, no place to hide. God is there, but He's there in full wrath. Again, there's a challenge and a comfort. The challenge is, even if you die, God is present with you. And if you die without Christ, He'll be there, but not in a good way. We, we don't know what it's like to really feel the wrath of God. As we live in this earth, we experience good things. Any good thing we experience comes from God. While well, that's taken away, God no longer pours out any goodness on people in hell. It's only wrath. But the comfort is this. It's this, that we go when we die into the very presence of the Lord. Psalm 23, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let me leave you with this in Philippians 1.21. The advantage is for me to live as Christ and to die is advantage. Why is that? It's because Christ has been punished for my sins. He's tasted God's wrath in my place. He's experienced hell in my place. And because of God's grace, if I'm united to God through faith in Christ, I can affirm this scripture. Let me read it to you. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, even the final reality we face, death, cannot separate us from God. So for those of us who are Christians, we will go immediately into the presence of the Lord where we will see, uh, begin to just understand a little bit of the omnipresence of God. So let me leave you with this thought, and then we'll be gone. I promised uh, them over there that we'll be done by a quarter till, and I'm keeping my promise. Uh, this one last thought is this. Remember this as you go through the rest of this week. Remember this as you go to work. Remember this as you go to school. Remember this no matter how lonely you may feel at any point in the, in the day. Here it is. You ready? Last thing. God cannot be any closer to me than he is right now. You can take that thought with you throughout every day of your life. God simply cannot be any closer to you than he is right now. He is omnipresent. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this evening. And indeed, it's been an unusual evening because of the weather. But we thank you, Lord, that you are present with us. That no matter where we go, even in a storm, 
that we cannot escape your presence. Lord, we thank you for bringing us here tonight to listen to your word as it's taught. Lord, we thank you that, that distance cannot hide us from you, that darkness cannot hide us from you, even death cannot hide us from you. And Lord, we look forward to this coming Friday for our Good Friday communion service. Lord, we pray that uh, there will be a good turnout for that and a, a good service that uh, actually observes uh, the sacrament of the Lord's Supper and what all that means and focuses on the cross. And then, Lord, we, we look forward to this coming Sunday morning. We can gather together as a congregation to fellowship and also to worship you and your Son, Jesus Christ, whom you raised from the dead. Lord, keep us safe as we go home tonight. Keep us safe this week. Bring us back into your house Friday and Sunday, for we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Let me mention this to you. Um, be sure to come to our brunch on 930. And the food's going to be great. And the way I know that is you're bringing it. So we look forward to that time together. Brunch at 930. Uh, service, Easter Sunday morning service at 1045. We look forward to our time together. Thank you.